students come into to public speaking and argumentation and advocacy really unsure of themselves. There's a pretty high degree of anxiety. And, and I make it pretty clear on the first couple of days, there are no dark corners in this classroom that you can retreat to and hide in um, because I'm going to, I'm going to draw you out um, from those and, and encourage you to speak up. Welcome to Faculty Voices, where we talk about teaching and learning and the incredible work you do in the classroom. My name is Craig Rickett. I teach public speaking and argumentation and advocacy. If you had to narrow it down to one thing, one idea, one key learning outcome, what is the one thing that you would like your students to learn from you? The power of self-expression. I suppose advocacy and self-advocacy as, as we experience it through self-expression. I, th I think at, just as we move into college, I think many people um, experience that sort of blossoming effect. And, and part of that blossoming is being able to express yourself, to articulate your ideas, and, and if necessary, to, uh, to defend a position. So that's, that's pretty much the main takeaway for me. How do you do that? M mostly by creating a safe space where students can experiment um, with self-expression. They're going to get some things wrong. They always do. But by allowing them the opportunity, I suppose, to, to develop their ideas and to prepare them and then actually to express them out to, a, to an audience of peers, um, I, th I think it gives them, you know, a little added confidence that, that maybe what they have to say and, and, uh, and maybe what they think is meaningful and worthwhile. So uh, creating a safe space is, is the first thing I try to do in class. Um, what does this, it look like? What is, what, how do you get that process started? Oh, uh, first day of class, I, I completely forego uh, syllabi and, and get students um, talking to each other. So in my public speaking class, um, I have students actually getting to know members of their audience. And so it is a kind of an icebreaker, but it takes the entire class period. Um, so they, uh, a student will introduce himself to a classmate and then that classmate will introduce that student to about half the class in a small group thing, but it, but it kind of mimics a, a public speaking setting a little bit. Oftentimes students are standing up and presenting their, um, their introduction partner uh, in the first day of public speaking. And so that, that creates that sense of community. After the first day of class, a student has learned the names and something about 10 people, 12 people in their class. So they immediately feel like they belong. They're not a stranger there. And I continue to sort of remind um, students of other classmates' name in the sense that on day two and day three, I will ask random people in the class, can you name the people that you got to know on the first day? It's remarkable. Um, many of them do, and then can continue developing that relationship uh, over the course of the quarter. And then I also, when I talk about audience analysis, which is beginning of the second week of class, uh, I really encourage students well, here's, here's kind of the context. By the second week of class, everybody has already become very territorial. They, they sit in their seats, they don't move, they don't, you know, they don't interact with, with anybody other than the three or four people around them. And so when we get to the part on audience analysis, I encourage everybody to sort of change it up a little bit. I don't require it, but I encourage it. So um, asking them, you know, tomorrow when you come to class, why don't you choose a different place to sit? Uh, why don't you, you know, walk across the room and get to know some people on the other side? Because these are your audience members and you will want to know as much about them as you can um, just to get comfortable speaking in front of them. So that's, that's in the public speaking 
in argumentation and advocacy, uh, again, first day of class, we don't do the syllabus. We have a mini debate, uh, a little, you know, really controlled environment um, where I ask people to uh, tackle a particular topic. Lately, we've been talking about the perceived benefits of having community college be tuition free. So that's been kind of a good ice breaking debate to use. So those two seem to be working pretty well for me in terms of creating a safe space and a, and a place where uh, students feel like they can express themselves. Well, so what's interesting about this, I, I want to follow up with this is uh, how do you um, facilitate that without being perceived as the power broker in the room? What do you do um, that creates this, um, this quality in the classroom where people are willing to be open with you? Well, first, in public speaking, they're not being open with me. They're being open with their, with their classmates. Uh -huh. um, I'm, I'm not a part of the introduction exercise in public speaking. I, I give the directions and then get out of the way and let them go. I keep the, I keep the activity moving forward, but the activity is not centered on me. It's, it's, this is your opportunity to introduce yourself to, to members of your audience. Um, let's take advantage of it. And so one way yeah. you're doing that is by stepping to the side and, and getting them to engage with each other as opposed to all eyes on you. Correct. Yeah. And in the argumentation and advocacy, I, I post the topic and, um, you know, set up the format. So uh, it'll be four people at a table and I'll say, okay, on, on this side of the table, you are going to be negative. Um, you're going to argue the negative, And on this side of the table, you're going to argue the affirmative. And I don't really give them, you know, the choice, do you agree or not agree with the resolution? Because one of the things that uh, I try to emphasize in advocacy is that you, as, as a public advocate, you don't always get to choose the side that you're on, but you still have, the ethical burden of presenting the best arguments you can for the sign that for the side that you've been assigned to. So, um, and they kind of get used to that pretty early on. And the speeches aren't long; they're two minutes. They're sitting down. It's just to the other three people there at the table, um, but it gives them an opportunity together to experience what it is like to to be in conflict. Um, to, to be exchanging arguments with people that you may or may not know while still remaining civil. That and seems I think important that, today, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ira, <laughs> that's opening up a whole new, a whole new topic. But yes, absolutely. I absolute. Um, I mean, civility, civility is the rule in the classroom itself. And um, I, I, after this many years, I haven't had a situation where it's gotten out of hand. So, um, well, and I imagine you're exploring and helping them explore this idea of discursive formation of cultural meaning. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a service being provided by being able to argue both sides of an issue or many mm -hmm. sides of an issue. Right. Right. And, and, you know, we'll come back to that first day's activity uh, throughout the rest of that first week, and we'll look at, you know, what, I mean, we'll get down to the, to the micro level of what does, what does free college actually mean? Um, you know, let's look at it from the standpoint of definition, and then let's look at it from the standpoint of what do we as a culture associate with the word free? How much value do we place on it? Um, what do we think as a culture, uh, when we, when we get something for free, um, and it really, it leads to some, some interesting discussions, but then that also helps them shape their thinking down the line when they're, when they're being asked to think about, uh, another resolution, um, you know, they, they analyze it from the standpoint of, I, sh I should know what this word means. So as an example, um, 
a couple of years ago, we were arguing about the removal of Confederate war hero memorials, um, statues in honor of, say, for example, Robert E. Lee, should they be removed? Well, a couple of, of advocates, of course, looked at the, the word remove and say, okay, <laughs> we'll take it out of this you know, for us, it means let's take it out of this park and put it over here in this other public place. So for them, removal was not making um, inaccessible. It was just moving from its current position to a different. So, you know, it, it, it makes for some interesting argumentation change when you have context. students thinking. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. I missed your comment. A change of context, really. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Basically, a change of geography, physical context. Yeah. Yeah. What drew you to communications? That was one of those discoveries I made in college. Um, actually, pretty late in, co in college, if I can be quite honest with you. I was a sophomore in college when um, a classmate of mine encouraged me to uh, one auditioned for uh, a play that she was directing and I, I had never been involved in theater uh, or drama and um, but I, I trusted her and and went ahead and auditioned and got a part and and enjoyed that so that that so that performance aspect of it was sort of reinforced there but then the following fall so this would be the fall of my junior year um, that same classmate encouraged me to uh, join the competitive speech and debate team. And I participated in uh, speech events, um, informative speaking, persuasive speaking, interpretive reading, hence the poetry. Um, all of those types of events uh, at um, intercollegiate tournaments. And I found out I was actually pretty okay at it. Um, won a couple of awards and uh, and then I think after my first tournament, uh, my junior year, I changed my major immediately to communication studies with a minor in theater and never looked back from there. Um, up to that point, I'd been a business major and not, not doing very well at it. <laughs> to be quite honest, I'm not a very good business person. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what's been your greatest success in the classroom? What drew you to teaching? Boy, I mean, realize you're looking at 35 years, right? Mm -hmm. 35 years of classroom experience. So, so um, I, I, I honestly don't know if I could put my finger on a single, gosh, I'm so proud of this moment. Um, There have been so many students who have done well, uh, say, for example, um, in the early 2000s, I think this was around 2003, 2004, uh, I had a particularly talented student uh, who was competing uh, for our uh, speech and debate club that we had at the time. And I mean, she worked her tail off all year long, went to every tournament, never missed. Um, practiced, 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 but she was also, you know, she also came with a really good toolkit. And um, as a community college student, you compete against students, not only from other community colleges, but uh, against students from four-year universities and colleges as well. And uh, this particular student uh, was awarded the top speaker for the year. I mean, it was a season long award. She had won more points for her team than any other speaker on any other team in the Pacific Northwest at that time. So I was, I was particularly proud of that moment because I, I got to see how her hard work um, and her dedication was, was really recognized and, and paid off for her in the end. So that was, that was a pretty proud moment for me. What have been some of the challenges that you faced as a, as an educator? <laughs> um, uh, wow, making the adjustment from um, from a 
private four-year college and university setting uh, and the students there to, to teaching community college students. Uh, 29 years ago when I started uh, teaching community college students, I, I, I felt in many respects, uh, this is a different, this is a different group of people. Um, and I'm not used to them. I, I, I myself didn't attend community college. I attended a private four year college. And then in my graduate work um, at Wake Forest, of, of course, that population was, was pretty privileged. Um, and, and so everybody, you know, it was pretty selective in, in its admission. And so everybody showed up with this, you know, great set of skills um, to set them up for success. And coming here to the community college and, and meeting our students and, and the really wide, wide array of preparation and skills, um, that, was, that was the biggest challenge. I really had to retool and, and begin thinking about what it means to be successful um, as an instructor. It's not, it's not necessarily, you know, just, just teaching to the top tier and ignoring everybody else because in a community college you do that, you maybe are teaching to two people in your class and then there's 24 people who are not getting any of your attention um, or who just aren't getting what you're, what you're trying to express to them. So I became pretty conscious pretty quickly of the variety of needs that were being expressed by students in my class and, and started to develop some tools to, to help them. Um, what do you love about community college? You've been here for, uh, for 29 years. So, um, what, what is key, what keeps you coming back? Uh, just that the variety, the, the, the challenge itself, um, keeps me coming back. I, I love, um, I love what I'm doing. Um, I, I, I had a colleague, uh, a couple of years ago after I had, um, after I had gotten out of administration. So this would be 2016. I had a colleague ask me, you know, um, what was administration like? And, and, you know, I had to, I had to be quite frank. I, administration is a job, but, but teaching is a calling. And um, I feel much more, you know, just from my standpoint, um, I feel much more at home and much more, um, emotionally connected to the work that I'm doing because I still get to work with students. Um, and administration was just one, one step too far beyond that. And, and so it wasn't quite as satisfying for me. Uh, but um, the, the daily challenge of, of trying to work with students and trying to help them realize their own potential. Um, so uh, it's, it's been, it's been a good, good career and, and, uh, and worthwhile, very satisfying in that respect. Some students are going through some really, uh, really difficult periods. Um, I, I had, uh, in, in both my public speaking and in my argumentation and advocacy class, I've had, uh, students who were transgendered, but they're just beginning that process of discovery and transition. And, and my class was actually sort of their testing ground for how they wanted to express themselves. And so I think um, some of the things that were being shared in those, in those classes were really, you know, pretty meaningful and pretty powerful for those, for those what students. What a privilege, isn't that? It just feels it, like such a privilege that they trust you. Uh, yes. And they trust yeah. the environment that you've created. Yeah, that's... Yeah. They, they feel that they are in a safe enough space where they can express themselves. Right. And, and of course, you know, their, their speeches aren't necessarily about, you know, what it means to transition uh, or, or what it means to live, you know, your first 16, 18 years with gender dysphoria, but, um, but just sort of watching them, you know, get their feet under them and, 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 and helping them find that new identity that, or, or, or I guess uncover the identity that they've always known they've had. Um, that's a really powerful, powerful testament to, um, 
to to a person's love for teaching yeah 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 that, that is one of the things i love about teaching it's it's such an honor uh yeah but how do you how do you reach the students that have a different learning or communication style from you uh, like how do you how do you cross that chasm between what's natural to you and the way you communicate and the way you teach to reach the students that their learning's a little different i mean the way you describe i was doing business <clears throat> excuse me the way you described that you know i was in business but it just wasn't the right fit but then communication was is it kind of a testimony to this idea that we all have different learning and communication styles and how do you reach those that uh maybe are taking this class from you that because it's a requirement uh, and that's not their major. Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of undiscovered talents. Uh, I think that, that people have that they've never been given the opportunity to, to explore. Um, and that becomes, you know, that becomes a part of the classroom atmosphere. I'm asking students to explore things that they haven't before. Uh, we do talk somewhat though about learning styles and, you know how that how that might affect the way that you're filtering um, a lot of the information that I'm sharing with you. I try to make as many accommodations as I can for these different learning styles. So, or or, or perhaps even uh, a learning disability. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a student who um, a recent example, a student who had profound dyslexia. Um, you know, I tried to work with a student to, to help her understand you don't have to bring notes up to the lectern to speak from because reading from notes is a difficulty for you. Let's, you know, let's figure out some different strategies so that you can feel prepared and fully rehearsed, but that doesn't put you in a position where you're having to read, um, which is a difficult thing for you to do while you're standing up in front of the audience. I mean, that's, it, it just, it seemed like the equivalent of standing by your desk in second grade and being asked to, you know, to recite and, and you're, you're feeling not confident and not knowing uh, how to do that. So, you know, I do try to adapt to, to the different learning styles as much as I can, but that's, that is so much about um, one, trying to identify okay, who in the class is struggling and what are the signs there? And two, just communicating with them, being, being pretty upfront. I, I notice that you are struggling here or I notice that you haven't handed in this assignment and there might be a number of reasons for you're not doing that. Um, let's talk about that and let's try to get you back on track as much as possible. That's not to suggest that I'm always successful. I mean, um, you know, one of one of the things um, that that I had to adjust to as a community college instructor is that some students just leave. Mm -hmm. You know, no notice, no notification, um, no follow up. They're just they're. I think the current term is ghosting. They have just ghosted the class, and as much as I try to reach out to them after they've left. Um, some do, some don't come back, but I, I don't know that that's a breakdown in, in my adapting to learning styles. I, I think that's one of those situations that, uh, the student is not quite yet sure enough of themselves to be in that community in spite of, of everything that I've tried to do to, to try to promote that. So, yeah. I think in those situations, I think uh, we just try to let them know we're here for them when they're ready to come back. Yeah. <laughs> well, and see, and, and, and th therein lies, I think, w one of the profound virtues of community college. And, and I tell students, that those students that, um, because it's been a rough quarter and they've been distracted by, by other life things going on outside around them, and, and they just haven't been able to do the work, um, I tell them it's okay. You know, you're not a failure. And when you are in a better place, come back. I'll be happy to work with you. I'll be more yeah. than happy to work with you. Yeah. So 
How do you remain current in your field? Right now, staying current means, I think for myself as an instructor, staying current means technology. Um, and that's, I'll have to tell you, it's been a stretch. Um, but I, I allow myself to collaborate with people who I think know a lot more than I do. <laughs> so uh, a couple of years ago, well, this is 2006, 2007. Maybe you can get help me with the dates, Ira. Uh, when did we do Blackboard? I mean, that was... Uh, yeah, that's, that's probably around 2005. Yeah. So I experimented with Blackboard. Total disaster. You know, we experimented with the hybrid um, modality. And, and it, we, we just decided it wasn't working very well for our students. But then as Blackboard became Angel and then Angel became Can didn't become Canvas, we just dropped Angel and picked up Canvas, um, I jumped back into that, uh, into that pool of learning management system. And um, I, I, I honestly believe it's done nothing but good things for my teaching. Uh, I, I think some colleagues feel like, you know, it's just going to automate everything and, and you know, it's just push a button and you're no longer engaged. I don't see that at all. I think, I think our learning management system that we have right now gives students so many different opportunities of addressing specific needs that they have in their, with their learning styles, you mm -hmm. know? So if, if you're not going to pick stuff up from a lecture, just because that's not how you process information, um, you have an opportunity to, see the lecture again or to go back, you know, to the, to the PowerPoint slide deck and actually or look at the notes or read a transcription. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are just so many opportunities right now um, given technology that um, it's, it's just been this, this ongoing um, discovery of, wow, here are all the different opportunities um, that are right there in front of us. So, yeah, I mean, right now, staying current is not necessarily staying current in rhetoric or public speaking or advocacy or those kinds of things. It's staying current with, with the means of delivery. Most of the things I teach, and, and probably this is different in your field, um, again, the technology is changing uh, continually, but I feel like the fundamentals of public speaking like the fundamentals of, of photography somewhat. I mean, those principles of composition don't really change that much. Um, the principles of speech craft, they've evolved somewhat, um, but most of the time, sorry about the noise. Do you want me to pause? Can no, you hear no, it? I, no, it's fine. You're fine. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> um, the, the tech, the, the speech craft is, I mean, as it's evolving, it's evolving to adapt itself to these emerging technologies. And so that for me has, has been, you know, kind of the focus as well. What's going on in, you know, in the world of people expressing themselves and sharing their ideas. Well, for me, um, Ted talks is one of the greatest inventions ever, ever made because it allows students to see and again, re-see all of these, um, all of these very good speak well some very good some not so good but but to see all of these different speakers and to um, analyze them on a number of different levels so yeah maybe develop an appreciation for the importance of ideas and the ability to articulate those ideas exactly yeah, yeah. which they're just which again they're discovering about themselves I have something worthwhile to say yeah well, so uh, this idea of um, changing modalities due to the current circumstances is really an, an opportunity to explore even deeper this idea of how do we communicate with one another and how much collaboration and cooperation is necessary uh, in order to achieve shared goals. Right. Um, and so I, I find myself going back as I heard you talk about the fact that, you know, rhetoric hasn't changed, even though the format and the, and the technology changes, leads me back to this idea of general education outcomes and the communication rubric. Um, can you talk about your 
involvement with the development of that rubric or how uh, general education outcomes play a role in the courses that you teach? Well, the, um, the communication rubric in terms of the development of that, I've been involved in conversations, I think, since 1996 when outcomes first first started to to gain some momentum on on campuses and it, it was largely as i think as a response to accreditation expectations and uh, and so we as a college had um had conversations about okay you know what are those um what are those abilities that we want students to be able to exhibit as a result of taking a series of classes on our campus. And, and it was it was good. I thought it was a good, fruitful conversation. Um, I know for some faculty, the, the outcomes movement has, has felt more drudgery than anything else, mm -hmm. um, perhaps because they've they've never allowed themselves to, to step back from the actual doing of the outcomes work to, to see the value of, of that liberal arts, I'll refer to it as a liberal arts perspective. In other words, the the, the sort of rounding out of the whole person, um, rather than just you know fitting them in a specific skill set for a specific job, which they may or may not get, or may or may not want, or a job that may or may not exist in um, another five years. You know, this whole idea of of helping. Um, sort of shape a well-rounded, well-educated individual. So I, I really, I like the the outcomes movement for that. Um, the the communication rubric for it, the the most recent um, communication rubric that we're that we're using in the in the general education, uh, I, I think speaks a lot to um, to what I teach because a lot of it in, in trying to shape the communication rubric so that it serves both art and English and communication studies, photography, perhaps. Yeah. Visual communication. Visual communication. Oral right. Communication um, as opposed to oral <laughs> communication, but yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so in, in that rubric, um, a lot of the emphasis in the general education area is is about the the ability to express. Um, it's it's the person having an idea. How do we shape that idea given the the different mediums and the different modalities for expressing that, and then sending it out there and taking responsibility for it as well. Understanding this particular message is going to have this particular effect on an audience member. And and being ethical responsibly ethically responsible for that. So yeah. So I I I um I I like that communication is is a part of that is is a part of our shared um, goal as as a, as a college. I have to tell you, I'm I'm pretty keen on information literacy too, though, as right. uh, as one of our general education outcomes, because that uh, that just becomes uh, so important when people are expressing themselves. And again, you know, this puts us in an interesting conversation given our per current political climate. Um, you know, who's who who's responsible for creating factually consistent messages. Um, ultimately, that has to be with the messenger themselves. So uh, we, we spend a fair amount of time in class talking about the value of, of, uh, of information literacy and, and what that means for them as students. And, and again, they'll make mistakes. Um, some of them will be quoting some pretty uh, suspicious sources in their speeches, and I'll I'll have to sort of you know step aside with them or or email them or something like that and say you know maybe maybe check the validity of this source uh, before you go quoting them too too far and wide. But that's what well, the classroom I'm is. Two, two things from you. Uh, let me let me. Uh, see if this resonates with you. Um, one, I'm hearing that 
during this period of change because of changing paradigms or, you know, changing context of, uh, you know, you're shifting from face-to-face -face modality to fully online for this quarter, um, that the, the general education outcome of communication is the constant while there's change and fluctuation happening. And so it's kind of this foundation work that uh, shapes what you're doing and gives you the ability to be flexible, remain flexible, uh, to be able to adapt and change as a, as a human being, as jobs come and go, and technologies change. W that's one thing I'm hearing from. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think I would agree with that. Yeah. And then the second thing I'm hearing uh, is really um, the gen ed outcomes that the college has uh, selected. We've we've narrowed it down to six that we have decided are the irreducible. Uh, outcomes, what it means to be educated, um, that you don't really work exclusively within one general education outcome because they're all interrelated because you are talking about communication, but you need to address informational literacy. You talk about the current world uh, situation, the scenario of uh, the fact that we have this COVID-19 pandemic would necessitate some quantitative literacy to be able to uh, communicate the importance of, of what's happening right now. You're going to require some quantitative literacy. There's going to need to be some critical thinking skills. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And then how do you hold attention is going to require some creativity as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so have I missed them? We've got um, creative thinking, critical thinking, informational literacy, uh, quantitative literacy, diversity. Uh, and I think uh, we've talked somewhat about yeah. the importance and why we think community college is a special place because of its opportunity to work mm -hmm. with diverse uh, uh, populations of students, diverse ideas, mm -hmm. the idea of, of being able to civilly argue and, and uh, have discursive formation of meaning uh, right. would suggest that, that these gen ed outcomes are uh, pretty important uh, mm -hmm. for the work that you're doing. Right, right. I'm, I am, uh, I'm not, f I'm not in any way frustrated professionally. Um, but, but sometimes I'm always interested in, um, you know, wanting to do general education assessment beyond the two, uh, gen ed outcomes that I've identified, you know, that are connected to, to public speaking and argumentation and advocacy. And I keep it consistently communication and information literacy, knowing full well that I could just as easily pick creative thinking, critical thinking, um, maybe not quantitative <laughs> analysis, but, uh, but the diversity um, but, but and multiple perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the nice thing is the the current system at Spokane Falls Community College for uh, conducting out uh, general education outcomes assessment happens at the individual instructor level. Right. And actually, the only reason there was a limitation of two initially was because it was this this large external activity that wasn't happening in the class. It was right. happening isolated outside of class. And so to mitigate the extra work that was happening, uh, we, we elected to narrow it down to two. But the reality is those six outcomes, I would uh, suggest are being, more than two are being covered in any one class on the AA degree. And, uh, and you have access to all of the rubrics to be able to assess those in your class now that we have this system that, that no longer pulls it out of the class but actually keeps it there and actually empowers the instructor to be uh, able to measure and assess their students. Yeah, yeah. One thing that I'm, I'm going to start doing kind of as an experiment this quarter, and it's probably not a good quarter for experimentation, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, I'm, I'm adding more of the gen ed outcomes to my rubrics 
uh, for a variety of different small assignments in my classes. And, and some of that will address uh, critical thinking, creative thinking, some of it will address um, the diverse perspectives um, outcomes as well. So that's, that's my hope that I start generating a little bit of that kind of data in, in my class for my benefit um, and to and to improve my own teaching, you know, where am I not doing enough in that area? I, I can't really. Um, I mean, I would love to incorporate quantitative analysis into my <laughs> into my classes as well. Uh, I I don't think I'm I'm tooled up enough for that. But uh, you know, maybe in a couple of years. Well, I really appreciate your time, and I've just got a couple things I wanted to ask more, and that is. Uh, since you brought up the fact that you have spent 35 years in the classroom, which is a powerful testimonial to the passion you have for teaching that, that you, keeps you coming back, what advice would you give to a, a new faculty member, uh, a new adjunct, a new tenure track? What, what advice would you give? Um, a couple of things, actually. It's, it's, uh, it's important for for new faculty to to stay current with with changes in how education is conducted. Um, the way I was taught is nothing like the way I teach. Uh, the tools that I have access to, none of my professors in college had access to. And so it's really important for me, you know, as these new technologies became available. Yeah, I, I'm a late adopter, but um, but I'm not a non-adopter. Um, so I'm 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 willing to let those people who are comfortable in these newer environments sort of sort of clear a path, um, experiment with some things, break some things, make some mistakes, and and I can I can watch um, for a while, but there comes a time to get to get in the game to to update my skills to keep my skills in, in those areas um, fresh and relevant. So I think my advice then to, to a new faculty member is to understand that the way that the way they were taught when they were in college is not the way necessarily that they will always be teaching. And there comes a time when you just have to, you know, confront as I had to confront, um, my my lack of skill in in certain areas and i have to i have to address that and that's that's on me it's not on anybody else it's on me so um that would be one piece of advice i i suppose the other piece of advice is if it doesn't feel like a calling maybe not do it um I, I think you have to have a passion for it. What's interesting to me about this is in my work as a general education outcomes assessment coordinator, in that work, I've had the opportunity to talk to faculty in every discipline and they blow me away with their passion, with their intelligence, with their commitment. And yet I don't hear that being expressed in a manner that, you know, we end up being uh, overwhelmed or, or sitting in our little, little part of the world. And we don't recognize how absolutely interconnected we are and how absolutely what a great job people are doing. Uh, and we are living through a period of time in, in mainstream uh, media where I'd say higher ed's a little, it's being questioned. It's being, uh, the idea of a well-educated, uh, critical thinking, um, questioning, and information literacy is um, being questioned in our society right now. And I think that um, part of the challenge is to not just stay hunkered down and try to weather the storm, but rather to uh, recognize just how we we are doing important work and right. and i just uh, i'm blown away by my colleagues every day and i find it so inspiring that i hoped that by creating this that our colleagues would start uh realizing just how how special they are and, and what they're doing is is yeah. really important yeah yeah we we are we are doing good work 
I'm, I'm very proud to be uh, associated and attached uh, to this faculty. I think we do some, some really tremendous work. Well, I'm going to take a change of uh, direction here. Okay. Um, what's one thing that your colleagues and your students might not know about you that is interesting? <laughs> I, I live in a town with, with 400 people in it and <laughs> lived there for 30 years. Uh, and, and that's a and, great story. I got to hear, <laughs> I want everybody to hear about this. Where do you live and how far of a commute is it? Well, I live, I live exactly f 44 miles from campus. So door to door, 44 miles, that's my commute, but it's all on, on, uh, I, I 195 or 195. So I'm a little closer to Pullman than I am to Spokane. Um, and that's my, that's my commute. I get to drive uh, through the north, north part of the Palouse every day and drop into the Spokane um, sort of trough and, and you're in a farm work. town, right? I'm in a farm town. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I moved my camera, I could show you the wheat fields. Inside. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm on the edge of a farm town, but it is, it's a small, yeah, community. When we first moved here, um, you know, we didn't we didn't lock our doors um, for probably the first fifteen, sixteen years that we lived here, and and it was explained to us when we moved <laughs> that we shouldn't lock our doors. And the reason why you don't lock your doors is because somebody might want to leave something in your house while you're away. <laughs> I see my dog's tails just showing up here. Hi, Modoc. Uh, the advantages of stay at home uh, and working from home as we get to yeah, our, yeah, our animals yeah. with us. So, so you live in a small farm town. Small little farm uh, town out on the Not blues. a farmer. No. Um, but... No. Um, anybody who's lived in this kind of community knows that unless you are a farmer, um, you're forever considered an outsider. So... <laughs> That's what I was curious about. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've, I've, I've been here almost 30 years now. Uh, my dad was the mayor of this town. Um, and still, I'm, I'm probably looked at as, as one of those people that don't quite belong because I'm not really attached to any particular tract of land. So. <laughs> but that's, that's fine. It's a good, quiet community on, on most days, and, and I really enjoy it out here. So that's, that's something that not... A lot of people know about me. Some people might know a little bit about my theatrical background. Um, my my one opportunity, my brush with greatness, I'll call it, uh, to act opposite Patty Duke in A Glass Menagerie. And I was excited, as excited, to, to act in a production of The Glass Menagerie as I was to be able to act opposite Patty Duke. I thought that that was just one of the greatest experiences. Um, I've ever I've ever had in theater, and then of course um, being able to produce uh, a play that I wrote um, a couple of years ago that was that was fun. So, wow! No. Yeah. What was yeah. the play about? Um, well, it's, it's called Seeds of Change, and uh, it's it's had three three productions now. But the the premier production was with Interplayers. Um, now defunct, sadly. Uh, yeah. Not not because of my production. <laughs> <laughs> no, players, yeah. yeah. I yeah. could go on about that place. I love it. Yeah. 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 But the the play is about um uh three sisters who are from a conservative uh religious background and it's it's sort of um How do I how do I describe it? For one of them, it's sort of a coming of age story, and and for the other two in in the household, so it's three sisters. Um, if I can refer to them as spinsters without creating offense, but three unmarried sisters who are living together from a conservative family, and one of them is sort of pushing the boundaries a little bit uh, with that. But there's a it's it's a comedy. Um, almost borderline farce in the second act. There's a couple of, of elements of that involved as well. Um, so, and, and at the time that the play was conceived, uh, Washington State hadn't legalized marijuana in any way, shape or form. <laughs> so it, it, has, um, it has some of those elements involved as well. So, yeah. 
but it's, it's a fun play. I'm so glad I asked this question. I'm so glad to hear about this because I, I think you also just illustrated something I think is so critical is that you're still practicing the craft of communicating. Uh, you're yeah. actively engaged in doing uh, artistic uh, work. And I just applaud you for that. That's just Thank phenomenal. You. Did you want me to read for you? Please. <laughs> I would love that. That would be such a treat. That would be great. This is Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Thank you. Thank <laughs> My, you pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. This presentation has been brought to you by the Spokane Falls Community College Italic Committee. Our mission is to promote effective teaching and to facilitate student learning by assisting in the development of outcomes assessment strategies for courses, programs, and degrees. Thank you for watching. <laughs>